Um, the speaker it himself is uh, sick, so he was not able to come to Israel, but still we managed to make it technologically so that uh, Alessandro will present. Um, he speaks through the microphone of the laptop, so the sound is relatively uh, low. He will do his best to uh, make it the best, but if you want to come forward, it will be um, better. So. It is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Alessandro um, Prigione. Dr. Prigione was trained as a medical doctor in the University of Milan and obtained his PhD from University of Milan Bioca at 2008, where he studied neurodegenerative diseases and mitochondrial function in health and disease. During his postdoctoral training, he worked on mouse iPS cells at um, the San Rafael Research Institute in Milan and on human iPS cells at the Max Planck Institute for Molecular Genetics in Berlin. His prolific work as a postdoc was cited well over a thousand times and was published in leading stem cells uh, journals. In 2015, he joined MDC Berlin, where he is the Delbruck Fellow and Independent Group Leader. Um, so, although Dr. Prigione is sick and couldn't join us here, we are privileged to still have him giving his talk through the internet, and we're all wishing you all the best and health from here. Thank you.
very focusing on one, which is called Lee syndrome. Uh, and this is a rare disease, one every 36,000 by birth. And mostly it's a brain disease. So here you see it's, uh, it's affecting most of the basal ganglia, uh, which are uh, here in chronic, and that's why it's characterized by psychomotor regression. And there is a treatment. So the cause of these diseases are genetic, as I said, but there could be some that are nuclear genes and some that are mitochondrial genes. But altogether, all genes in the real cause of this syndrome are encoding for proteins of the oxidiposphoriation machinery, so oxidos. So, uh, and there's two other spots one in the mitochondrial genome, A56, and one in the nuclear gene, uh, genome, which is sort of one. So, A56 is complex 5 of the reluctant transport chain, and sort of one is an assembly factor. Complex forms. So each cell is not part of the complex, but it helps assemble that complex. So we chose these two genes because our hotspots, although there are, there are many others. Uh, but I just want to show you, before we go into data, why it is to pick these two genes and what are the challenges. So, for mitochondrial DNA, there are clear challenges because it cannot be engineered. So we cannot have transgenic uh, mice or we cannot have uh, transgenic cell line. Of, we cannot have mitochondrial CRISPR. This is because mitochondrial DNA is different from nuclear DNA. It's a circular DNA. We don't need transgenic And it's spread in multiple copies. So you can have thousands of copies in one sense. And, and a lot of these things, you can see all of there's a lot of mutations that can affect uh, various genes. And the one that I mentioned here is a um, so for SIRF1 instead, it's a nuclear gene, so it is possible to generate models instead. And this what has been done, has been done like from, uh, from worms to fish to mice. But what is interesting is that although they may show some mild complex spore defects, they didn't show any neurological impairment, so they didn't recapitulate the disease. Recently, this year, there was a, from the, um, the group of Gali and, and, uh, and uh, Zidiani, they demonstrated the published work where they made pigs, piglets, with sort of a knockout. They saw some uh, um, neurodevelopmental impairment, but they didn't see any complex effect. So it seems that uh, the conclusion is that it seems that some other humans complex, the center of complex four is much more dependent on surf one than in other animals that are being so far investigated. So that means that although we have a nuclear mutation where we could have some tools, somehow we're still uh, lacking some of these tools because of this particular human specificity. So altogether, these are some of the challenges that we have when we address this mitochondrial disease. So the way that we approach is that instead by using IPS cells, so it used to record stem cells, and, and we're interested mainly in the neuronal lineages because, uh, like I said, uh, the neuronal tissue is the one that is most affected. So when we make neurons, so we, have, we go through a stage of NPC, so neuron progenitor cells. This is just a, it's important for you to know because then uh, we talk a lot about NPCs. And these are progenitor cells that can give rise both to neurons and DNA. So, uh, when my student Carmen Lawrence started to make uh, neurons and NPCs, we looked at the biogenetics of the mitochondrial function, and we found that from reported stem cells, from IPS cells, to NPCs and neurons, mitochondria were looking very differently. So, in, in IPS cells, mitochondria are more um, fragmented, with very sparse secreted. Secreted here are the size of oxidiposphoriation. So this is because preposition cells are mainly glycolytic. So they, direct, they rely on glycolysis and not on mitochondria. So by the said, as soon as we make NPCs, we already see your mitochondrial maturation in a similar way as in Europe. So we could, this could suggest that an NPCs, although they are progenitors, they may already switch on, on oxos uh, So in fact, when we measure glycolysis level, we see that in preposition stem cells, it's very high, but in neurons and, and so in NPC, it was already as low as in neurons, so they were already going for uh, 
control uh, metabolism uh, machinery. And we put this to the test by growing the cells on, on galactose because uh, in this way it forces the cells to use oxalates. And so reprocessing cells are diabetic, they can only use oxalates so they die when they are grown only in galactose. But NPCs, they can survive. So, um, so we think that NPC are really are dependent on oxalates. So, uh, but at the end, NPCs, we also wanted to see whether they retain the same mitochondrial genome sequence. Because if we were studying NPCs or neurons, we want to make sure that we're studying disease that are with the same, with a, still uh, harboring the same uh, genetic features. And so, this is what we found. So, in black was the genome of the, the Farbas, in red, the active cells, and in growth NPCs. And these are all the variants. Which are not uh, disease specific, and that here was the one that is disease specific, and it's, they were all retained at the same level. And this is not somehow um, trivial, so it was not necessarily the case. This is because when we were programming for fire, that's very the sense. You, because believe that you may also have a reprogramming of these very copies of my country genome. So, but in fact, this, we found that this is not necessarily the case. Can make MPC from Firebus through reprogramming that they still retain the same mitochondrial genome sequence. So, in this way, uh, this suggests that if we find phenotype, it could be linked to the genotype that we see in the patient. So, which kind of phenotype did we see? So, uh, first we were uh, interested in a mitochondrial function. And we look at the magnified uh, uh, effect in the MMP, which is the mitochondrial membrane retention. So we found that in the NPCs, in the patient, the MMP was abnormally high compared to the control. And we didn't see when we look at other tissues like fibroblasts or cyrus, when we look at other uh, tissues that are not affected or other models. There are not dependent on mitochondrial respiration, we didn't see this effect. So, suggesting that this sort of phenotype, we couldn't have seen it by using, I don't know, X cells or, 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 or other, uh, other cell lines, because these cell lines are diabetic, like this, this cyberbis, I mean, these are also sarcoma cells, and these are diabetic, and these are other systems, but they, they are not dependent on oxygen, and they don't show this phenotype. When we make neurons from these NPCs, which can be made, so it's not that neurons can be made, but also they show this effect. So we think that this is uh, important. Going to identify phenotypes that are important for the disease is essential to look at the, the actual cell type that are affected by the disease. So, what is this MMP? What is the consequence of this MMP? So basically, the mitochondrial potential keeps is important for, uh, for keeping the calcium within the mitochondria. So if, it's, so if it's too high, calcium cannot be released from the mitochondria. And then it can accumulate within the mitochondria. So then we explore this idea and we look at the uh, calcium homeostasis. So we found that by looking at proteomics uh, um, of NPCs, we found that the calcium pathway was in fact um, dysregulated. And then we try to release the calcium from the mitochondria using depolarized agents. And we see that in the patient here, this release of calcium from the mitochondria was decreased. So here is a video of it. You can see in the control, once we put this, uh, uh, so these are preloaded with the calcium dye and go forth. And then when we uh, give a speed and optimizing it, the calcium that is in the mitochondria should be released. But in the patient, this is much, 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 much uh, 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 less, suggesting that then there's more calcium retained inside the mitochondria, and then the whole calcium in homeostasis is, is impaired in the cells. Uh, so then we think, okay, then maybe we have a, a phenotype that it could be potentially relevant for disease. So we establish an content uh, analysis assay, so basically microscopy based, and my student Annika Zink did that. So basically this is a, a 
on the MPI, and then also we have a, a, a cost gain for apoptosis. This is was live uh, MPCs. And we benchmark to make sure that when we were using uh, drugs, they were decreasing or, like in the case of RP, or, or increasing uh, by other potential. We could see that. So, for example, by MCP, we know that we can increase MP, we have effect apoptosis. Polygomycin can increase MMP. So we have basically uh, a Z factor, a good Z factor. And so then we thought, okay, maybe we produce this assay for screening compounds that could somehow ameliorate this abnormal uh, increased MMP in the patient disease. This is what we did. We basically had this our, so from my case, the patient had this disease, and we used uh, a library of uh, FDA approved compounds. And using this uh, MMP uh, live screening. So, we really define uh, one of the promising it uh, is a manatee, which is a PDE5 inhibitor. In the next slide, we'll explain a little mechanism. But the important thing is that PDE5 inhibitor was able to decrease the MMP, but at the same time, when we test the mitochondrial casting release, it was and it increased a bit in MPCs and also in the euros. So the treatment of Banafi compared to TXO was able to uh, restore a bit of this cancer release uh, of the homeostasis of, of, of the cells. And so now, of course, you may know that PD5 inhibitors are well known for uh, uh, drugs, and we were a bit um, unsure whether we could suggest this drug for, for kids. But it turns out there is a big use for uh, pulmonary hypertension uh, in, in, in babies. So there are pediatric doses that can be used. And uh, so now we're attempting to uh, perform a very, very small clinical trial. It's more like an uh, uh, individual uh, trial because, of course, it's a very rare mutation. So we only have uh, some of the individuals for which we may have disease are still alive. Some of the babies, some of them have died. But the ones are still alive are attempting to see whether uh, we produce them according to the doses that are already being suggested in the in the uh, in the thirty things. So to summarize this part, with the TP6 phenotype, uh, TP6 mutation, we identified one target MMP that we couldn't have identified using another model, and then we think that this is uh, causing an effective uh, accumulation of gas in the mitochondria reduce calcium in, uh, in the cytoplasm, and so a reduction in the uh, homeostasis of calcium and the uh, neuronal function. So this PD5 inhibitor, this is our hypothesis, might function here at the level of potassium uh, channel in the mitochondrial membrane. This is how it's been demonstrated by others. We we're trying to see whether maybe this could be the actual target that we could uh, use. Um, but before uh, going into this details, I, since it's a rare, rare disease and, and there are several genes mutations are causing the same phenotype, we wanted to see whether we could have some commonalities. And that's why we're studying other diseases. So now I'm switching to the other mutation in SORP1 for the last few minutes of my talk. So, uh, so SORP1 instead is a nuclear gene, and so we could use CRISPR-Cas to correct it. So, so my student Gizem uh, made uh, IPS cells from two patients that with the help of my poster puzzle, they correct the mutation using CRISPR-Cas. It's a homozygous mutation, they correct the mutation in both uh, alleles. Um, and, and basically they use uh, uh, strategy that I'm not going into details. Uh, but the important thing is that the function is that it's fully restored once you correct the mutation. So because you see that we look at this complex spore assembly, so SORP1 I mentioned is not part of the complex spore, but it helps the assembly of complex spore. When we have mutation, this complex spore is not assembly, but when we correct the mutation, we can see that assembly is similar to the, I mean, that it is still possible, uh, uh, like it was in the control uh, set. Basically, we made this set, we correct the mutation, and now we want to do it again like neurons and MCs and so on. So we decided to uh, be more specific in the kind of differentiation that we are doing. So this is uh, 
published work. And we're using a, uh, we call it composite culture because it's, spread, it's composed of both neurons and here. That is for starting from a disease, it can last for four or eight weeks. And we know there are neurons that are mostly dopamine edge neurons because this is what we wanted to do because of the disease affecting basal ganglia and the uh, motor uh, function. Uh, but there's also here, so here we get a GMP, here is a one the same. The composition of this culture, however, remains the same. When we compare the control, the limitation, so there was a change in the, in the neurons, fusion one positive cells, but there was also no change in the astral size, the, the, the 2B5 or plus positive cell. So it seems that, like, like before, we can make neurons, but the question is, how good are these neurons? And so basically, we found that what is disrupted is the maturation of neurons. Uh, so, for example, here we look at the physiology data of the potassium curves in the neurons and um, they are made from controls from the two patients. Uh, and this is over the time, so four, six, and eight weeks uh, starting from MPC, you see in the control that uh, at eight weeks you see a much higher uh, uh, voltage, uh, but in the patient this is not the case. When we correct the mutation, we see again an increase. So we see that basically due to this mutation, the neurons at eight weeks, they're not able to, to reach the same ability to fire the actual active controls. The same is for, for, for sodium currents. Again, at four, six, and eight weeks, we see the control is progressing, but not in the patient. When we correct the mutation, again, we see the correction of that. Uh, and, and this is exemplified by the number of spikes. This is a way to see how much the neurons can be functional. And here is clear that the control and the, and the corrected line here above, they spike much more than the patient line. And, and particularly they spike much more in terms of the repetitive spike. So they want their, they have several spikes in a row. So here is the control, you see that repetitive spike, not the patient, and again the corrected line against the repetitive spike. So this is the, the key difference, so that the, when we have the mutation at eight weeks, the neurons, they are not spiking as much as the control. So that means neurons can be made, but, not over, but they are not able to reach the same maturation. So the, the reason for that, of course, we look into bioenergetics in the mitochondrial function, and we found that by looking at the seahorse at the oxygen consumption rate, we see that NPCs are ready, show an effect in the respiration and then again four weeks and eight weeks this composite culture is reduced but the effect starts already at the NPC level like before so that means that already the progenitors they have an effect and this is why the neurons then switch to uh, oxos and they become to suffer more the more they become dependent on oxos the more they will be suffering from this uh, mutation uh, when the correct mutation is Store. So in our isogenic control, this is restored for the NPCs, for weeks and weeks. But this effect again is not present in fibroblasts or in active cells. So this uh, whole car, so all these cells have the same mutation. But in fibroblasts, they even rely on us so as much as we know and as much as we can also demonstrate that. But still, they don't show the effect we see in the neuronal image. So, Suggesting that it's not only that the cells are like us, but it's really that a lot of the effects are appearing in NPCs and neurons, but not in other cell type. This is what we see also in patients. Uh, so this could be due, for example, to calcium mistakes or, or other factors. And I, so, so what is the, what happens, right? So if these neurons may be far less, what is the consequence? So, what we saw again, we use this high content imaging uh, and we look at the length of the branch and the complexity of the branches. So, in green are the length, and in yellow dots are the branch points. And, and we saw that in the control, where we have neurons at four or eight weeks, the number of branch points was similar, but in the patient, was actually increased. So, they tried to make, so they tried to compensate this lack of functionality by making more branches, but these are disorganized. And so basically, they are, so they are, it's basically 
very much, um, uh, yeah, the user graph. So it is not given the same organization and it's not as functional. This is very good, very interesting, but now here we are a bit stuck because we tell okay, but then how can we understand that we will need a, an animal system or something more? Take a message that 
describe this neurogenesis in humans, which would be a specific human feature, and maybe that's why we don't see that in uh, animals. But more practically, that means that we could use an disease that is a drug discovery model, like I showed you before, because they're also much more uh, easy to be used compared to yours. And with that, uh, I would like to thank my group, and especially I uh, mentioned Nicholas Ryaski, and also uh, Michael Gotthard for Electrophysiology, Rob Kuhn for the Genome Editing, and uh, I have to thank my collaborator at the clinics, so uh, Marcus Shukri, who provided the uh, search one patient, and Andrew K, who provided the six uh, material from the six patient. Thank you very much for the attention, and I hope I was enough here, and you could hear me. Thank you, Alessandro. We will take one question, please. Okay, Dana. Alessandro, the question is, yeah. how do you make a control for your studies? Is it taken from a typical developed patient? Yes. Well, this is, a, this is an excellent question. So the problem with that is exactly this. What are the best controls? So for, for nuclear mutation, like I showed for SORP1, the best control is just correct mutation with crispr cas and then you have the same patient line the same background, only the mutation is corrected, and this is called so called isogenic control, and this is the best control. For mitochondrial uh, mutation, we don't have this opportunity, so we cannot make isogenic controls, so we have to use various several controls, and so the reviewers for the journal they ask more control, more controls, because it's not, it's a very key, key, key issue that every every cell line, every IPS cell line may be a bit different. So we need to have the right control then. So we think for certain points we are fine with the, the isogenic control. Um, but for it for like other mutation is difficult. Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much Alessandro.